Growing concerns over juvenile crime across Maryland after a string of violent crimes committed by young people. I asked DJS Secretary Vincent Chiraldi about kids on ankle monitors who go on to reoffend. They're working 94.6% of the time, so 19 out of 20 times. But opponents aren't buying it. He wants one thing, and that's for juveniles to be released. I'm going in depth on DJS data, policy, and calls for the secretary to resign. Thank you for joining us for this week's edition of Fox 45 News in Depth. I'm Mackenzie Frost. Recent crimes committed by juveniles, some of them already under Department of Juvenile Services monitoring, has some Maryland residents on edge. Just today, Baltimore police arrested a 12 year old and a 14 year old who they say robbed a man at gunpoint. According to police, the 12 year old was wearing an ankle monitor and had five prior robbery arrests. This isn't the first time that we have seen juveniles offend again while on ankle monitors. Earlier this month, three teens were arrested for allegedly robbing a Royal Farms. They were placed on ankle monitors, but police say later that day, those same teens went back to the Royal Farms and tried to rob it again. DJS Secretary Vincent Chiraldi says his department's monitoring policies are working, but law enforcement argues DJS data doesn't match what they're seeing. To me, it's disingenuous. I'd like to see the data from the last two weeks or the, the pressure that you guys have put on him um, uh, over the last several weeks when it comes to incarcerating violent offenders, because I think that's a recent phenomenon. I don't think that's anything that he believes in. Well, Secretary Schiraldi says the ankle monitors are successful nearly 95% of the time. We're digging into that number. During a virtual interview, Secretary, I wanted to first by just talking about the news of the day. The Department of Juvenile Services Secretary Vincent Schiraldi says his agency is working to balance holding young offenders accountable and fostering rehabilitation. A family whose loved one has been harmed may or may not be, you know, happy with what I'm saying right now, but I want them at least to understand that we are trying to improve public safety. We're trying to do it by holding kids accountable and by turning their lives around and rehabilitating them. And that most often that's working well. But examples of scenes like this one, in Butchers Hill earlier this fall or last year in the same area or carjackings like the arrest of teens caught on surveillance video can make it difficult for people to take the secretary's word for it. It's easy to in the rear view mirror say oh something happened this system must not be working but if you put that 19 kids that didn't reoffend in detention what would happen is they tend to get more hardened so there's a cost either way, and what we're always trying to do is look to get better and better at figuring out which kids it is that should be sent to detention, which kids should go home. We think we're doing that reasonably well. 19 out of 20 times is pretty good. The Department of Juvenile Services setting us this report, indicating 94.6% of kids on electronic monitoring had no new charges. On October 15th, the DJS spokesperson told us 132 juveniles statewide were on GPS monitoring. However, the data now being called into question. Sources tell Fox 45 News not only is there a difference between electronic monitoring and GPS monitoring, but the number of kids on each type of monitoring is higher than what DJS has been telling us. Thursday, we send questions to DJS asking, please explain why the department did not make that distinction before. What's the actual breakdown of youth on community detention versus electronic monitoring? How many staff members does DJS have monitoring youth on electronic monitoring or anything else? Late Thursday afternoon, Fox 45 News confirming with DJS there is a difference. We're learning there are 105 juveniles on electronic monitoring, which is connected to a box at the child's residence. That box tracks the juvenile's movement via an ankle bracelet and alerts staff when they go out of bounds. There are 118 juveniles on GPS monitoring, which an ankle monitor tracks the child's exact location. Lisa Gary, Deputy Secretary for Community Services at DJS, tells Fox 45 News, quote, there's never an intention of the agency to mislead the public or our partners, but I think we can do a much better job educating who the kids are on the various levels of supervision. While the department says there is nearly a 95% success rate of kids on electronic monitoring, 
A quick search of police data from Baltimore alone shows just how often repeat offenses take place. In September, police arrested a group of teens suspected of a string of carjackings, including a 14-year-old boy who was already wearing an ankle monitor stemming from a previous armed robbery, stolen auto, and assault charges. Earlier that same month, BPD arresting a 12-year-old and a 15-year-old in connection to a robbery. The 15-year-old was wearing an ankle monitor at the time of the arrest for a previous robbery arrest. Both suspects were released by DJS. On October 8th, BPD arrested a 17-year-old in connection to three robbery warrants. Police say they used the teen's ankle monitor to find him. Just Wednesday, BPD announced three juveniles, 15, 14, and 13, were arrested and accused of stealing a car. All three, according to police, had prior arrests, including for stolen vehicles. So clearly, an ankle monitor does not seem to be a deterrent. So why is the department continuing to use them as such? The department's been using ankle monitors since uh, Governor O'Malley started it over 10 years ago. But right and now, are they not working? And that's because um, they're working 94.6% of the time, so 19 out of 20 times. I don't think that's a catch and release policy. There are lots of kids that get detained. There are some kids that get put on electronic monitoring, and there are some kids that go home. And most of the time, but not all of the time, because nothing's 100%, they don't reoffend. I, I think that the community members who have been victimized by these kids who continue to reoffend would certainly disagree with you on that, Mr. Secretary. I've been victimized by violent crime, I've been victimized by sexual crime, and I've been victimized by property crime. And I absolutely empathize with people who have been the victims of crime and their family. That's why I work every day to help reduce crime and improve public safety. This week, Southeast Baltimore residents and community leaders had a chance to share their concerns about what they call a surge in crime across the area. Many expressed frustration with DJS policies and Secretary Schiraldi. And I understand the philosophy that Vince Schiraldi has, that some of the social workers have at DJS, that they don't want to lock kids up for four to six months at a time or more because it's not good, it's detrimental for their health as well. But at the same time, what about the victims? I'm worried that there's no consequences. And so because there's no consequences, it's just going to keep happening over and over and over again. Some of the concerns over consequences for juvenile offenders and the potential to reoffend stem from what critics call DJS's catch and release policy. You just heard Chiraldi there push back on that. The secretary announced juveniles who are arrested for a violent offense will now be placed on monitoring. And if they commit another violent offense while on monitoring, they'll be detained. Joining us now to talk about DJS monitoring policy is attorney Jeremy Eldridge. Jeremy, thanks for joining us here today. First of all, I want to just go over some of the difference that we're now learning between electronic monitoring and GPS monitoring. Can you break down the difference for our viewers in an understandable way? Of course. The piece of jewelry or the equipment that a juvenile is wearing is essentially the same. It's just a device that can be utilized differently. The first of which would just be like you carry your cell phone around. We can know your whereabouts, we know your location by hitting off different phone towers. So one way to monitor a juvenile is simply knowing that child's whereabouts because of their GPS location. The second way, community detention electronic monitoring, is really just being able to draw what I would call geofences. Can the child go to a school? We know the child's at the school. Can the child go home? We know the child's going home. And these two things can be utilized differently to restrict the freedom of that juvenile. And from what I understand, there's different usage for the GPS monitoring versus the electronic monitoring. Depends on sometimes where the offender, in this case a juvenile, is at in the entire legal process of the, the crime that they may be accused of. But at the end of the day, who is monitoring these ankle monitors? Well, first, to your point, on from a pretrial perspective, meaning before you're adjudicated as a juvenile, it's more common to have your liberty restricted, to have that community detention electronic monitoring, which is more like home detention in the adult system. After you're adjudicated is when we see more GPS monitoring. If a juvenile is released from being detained at a facility like Hickey, for instance. The next point is, there has to be a systematic efficiency, meaning every part of the system has to work. The bracelet has to turn on and work. The kid has to be reporting. If there's noncompliance, the juvenile uh, official actually has to 
be aware of the noncompliance and inform the court. And lastly, the court actually has to respond, do something, set a hearing, and potentially deal with that noncompliance. If all of those cogs in that wheel aren't working, then we have systematic failure, which frankly, even with a 94% efficiency, if 6% isn't working, the system's broken. And are we, I mean, the 6% that we're talking about appears to be the instances that we continue to see in examples of young people going out and committing these other crimes. When it comes to, is the process working? From your experience, can you say right now that all of the pieces to this puzzle are in place and everything is working effectively? I don't need to be the authority because we have too many stories in the news currently that show that the system isn't working. And the 94% rate is probably a false number because you have to wonder when we're talking about 94%, how does DJS classify the breakdowns? How do they classify the non-compliance? If it's simply a warning and the juvenile is placed back on to monitoring, they may not see that as a failure. So you really have to dig into that number to decide whether the 94% is truly an A plus or whether it's more of a C minus. These are all questions that we will continue to ask the department, no doubt. Jeremy Eldridge, thank you for joining us uh, today. I appreciate your time. Thank you. And it's not just monitoring policies facing scrutiny. The Maryland State Board of Education voted this week to adopt a major policy change, now requiring schools to inform each other about students' criminal histories. That decision coming just one week after a Howard County High School student accused of murder brought a loaded handgun to school. That student had an attempted murder charge from a year prior while he was a student in Anne Arundel County. But that information was not shared with Howard County Public Schools when the teen enrolled there. Howard County Superintendent Bill Barnes says it's a sign of systemic gaps in the system. My frustration is recognizing there are, are systemic gaps that resulted in, in this case, thankfully only a student possessing a loaded gun in a school and not using a loaded gun in school. Still to come, we're taking a closer look at statewide calls for change inside DJS, why a growing number of residents, lawmakers, and others are demanding Governor Westmore replace his secretary. And as we head to break, let's take a look at today's top headlines. C-based law firm hired to review the city's heat safety protocols and procedures, essentially finding none existed. The report claiming, despite a quote, history of heat-related medical emergencies before Silver's death, DPW employees hadn't received heat safety training in years, weren't given the tools to respond to heat emergencies, and expressed fears of retaliation for raising safety concerns. This report has a paved the way for us to identify a lot of the issues. We have taken steps already in dealing with most of these issues. The crime scene tape still sitting in Patterson Park marks the spot of a late night shooting. I have a victim here in the middle of the park, closer to the softball field. It's a Hispanic male adult. Just feet away from where kids play and right along walking paths. Police say the man was shot multiple times. Despite trying to save his life, they say he died on the scene. But there are still key questions about what happened, like what led up to the shooting and who pulled the trigger. Calls are growing across the state for Department of Juvenile Services Secretary Vincent Schiraldi's removal. Community members and lawmakers alike say they are fed up with ongoing juvenile crime and some Marylanders even fear for their safety. Maryland State Senator Justin Reedy says recent incidents are a sign that Schiraldi needs to go. I can't imagine the idea that a 17 year old who was suspected of attempted murder and had been picked up since then in a car theft was in a high school with a loaded gun mm -hmm. with an ankle monitor and the school didn't really even know it. I just can't imagine that happening at my children's school and uh, it's outrageous and that's kind of the last straw. There's been a lot of problems with the department, but that to me is absolutely the last straw and he needs to go. The Maryland Sheriff's Association is also calling for change, sending a letter to the governor asking him to demand Chiraldi's resignation. Association president and current county sheriff in Carroll County, Jim DeWee, says Chiraldi has a bad reputation among law enforcement and he wants the governor to replace him with someone who will hold young offenders accountable. I've been doing this for 36 years. I couldn't tell you 
the name of a former DJS secretary, but I certainly know this guy's name, and so does everybody in law enforcement around the state. And we're extremely frustrated, and we're done with this individual. The governor needs to put somebody new in place that understands what public safety means and understands what rehabilitation means. We can walk and chew gum at the same time, but this, this guy doesn't seem to want to do that. He wants one thing, and that's for juveniles to be released. Several lawmakers have called Chiraldi's policies, quote, dangerous for Maryland and their policies he's touted throughout his career. One year ago, Chiraldi appeared on the podcast Decarceration Nation, where he talked about reducing the number of people on probation, claiming he, quote, flew under the radar as corrections commissioner in New York. I flew under the radar, which was actually not a bad thing when you're trying to make some profound criminal justice reforms, especially in a city where there were lots and lots and stop, of fr stop and frisks, and there was a very sort of testosterone-driven approach. As a Southeast Baltimore community is raising its own concerns, delivering a petition to the governor demanding Chiraldi's removal. Nearly 3,000 people have signed on so far, mostly residents and business owners near Patterson Park. The petition claims Chiraldi's policies have severely compromised public safety, arguing juvenile offenders are repeatedly committing crimes, often within hours of being released to their guardians. Community activist Arch McCowan says that thousands of signatures show that community members want to get involved to enact change. I think that, you know, each person signing it, you know, they are showing that, you know, they, they have skin in the game and they want to... Um, affect a change. I think that looking at his track record, looking at what he's all about, I think Vinny Chiraldi just does not get the public safety aspect of his agency. Meanwhile, more than 100 residents and dozens of local organizations have also signed on to a rival petition defending Chiraldi, claiming media coverage is sensationalized surrounding a small number of high-profile cases and it's driving harmful narratives. They worry that could drive reflexive and ineffective policy responses and argue Chiraldi brings expertise and oversight to a department that suffered from neglect and poor resource allocation under the previous governor's administration. The rival petition has collected 201 signatures, including 62 organizations and 139 individuals. Former director Shante Jackson of the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Safety and Engagement is among those who publicly signed. If there's anyone who is up to the job, it's our Secretary of Juvenile Services, Vinny Chiraldi. Governor Wes Moore has long defended Secretary Chiraldi, calling him a national leader in juvenile justice and mass incarceration reform. It's those same policies that have led critics to call Chiraldi dangerous for the state, but for more than a year after Governor Moore appointed and the Senate confirmed him as head of DJS, the governor continues to call Chiraldi a reformer. We need a reformer because that department needs reforming. And I knew that I could not put someone there and I would not put someone there who was just uh, happy to be there kind of uh, kind of secretary. Secretary Chiraldi is a person who is a reformer and has a history of being a reformer. He reformed the New York City Corrections Department. He did it under Michael Bloomberg. But in light of the recent controversy, Governor Moore has largely kept quiet. Over the past few weeks, Governor Moore has been on the campaign trail for the Vice President Kamala Harris. Here we have a photo of him in Michigan last week, the same day a second teenager was arrested in connection to this month's deadly shooting in Columbia. And this is video of the governor appearing on CNN earlier Thursday afternoon from Wisconsin, again on the campaign trail for Vice President Harris. Earlier this month, I did get a chance to question the governor about whether he still supports Secretary Chiraldi. He didn't give me a direct answer, but it wasn't a ringing endorsement either. We're all praying for Bernie and playing for his, uh, for his, for his, uh, for his safe recovery. Uh, but the thing that we know is we are working together to ensure that we can keep our communities. Safe. Does that mean Secretary so Chiraldi, you, he still we're, has we're, your support? We are going to continue working together to make sure our communities are safe. Political analyst John Didi joins us now to talk about the impact the governor could have on DJS. Now, John, you and I have talked about this and the calls for Chiraldi to resign. I appreciate your time today. What do you think people should read into the fact that the governor hasn't really weighed into this issue specifically, especially in the recent weeks? I think he's hearing a lot of noise from a lot of state's attorneys who are very concerned about this issue. And the one people have not spoken up are basically Democratic legislators in Annapolis because they don't want to 
go ahead, get out ahead of their skis and say something critical and then get on the governor's bad list. So I think they're being very smart in that sense to do that. I think privately he's probably being told a lot of things. But Moore has made it clear, for the most part, that Chiraldi's his guy, and he's all in on him. And while that's all well and good, the problem is when you have videos of some of these horrific crimes that juveniles are committing, people want a sense of urgency, some sort of action, something being done as far as these problems. And so what do you think it will take, or do you think there is ever going to be a tipping point where we could see the governor come out and say something needs to change? As far as a tipping point, unfortunately, it will take almost another video incident to something happening like this where people finally get fed up. There has been a change over the last four years. Four years ago at this time, George Floyd was the name, policing was being criticized, et cetera. And there was an article recently in Atlantic Magazine about carjackings in PG County and youthful offenders getting really involved in this and how the PG County authorities are really trying to deal with this problem. And the thing is, you need support from the state. You need support from local jurisdictions to try to deal with this stuff. And I think that, unfortunately, police agencies and state's attorney's offices feel like they're, they don't have their backs as far as the governor having their back in situations like this. Do you think, looking ahead to January with the General Assembly, could you see a scenario play out where nothing changes within leadership at DJS and that becomes the big talking point, especially for Republican lawmakers who are already calling for Chiraldi's resignation? If nothing changes, do you think that could emerge as a big issue in January? If nothing changes, it's going to be a big issue. And this, and the, another issue is going to be the state budget, because the reason Governor Moore is in Wisconsin, Michigan, and other places is he's backing Kamala Harris, because if, pres if former President Trump wins, state funding is going to decrease dramatically money from the feds. That's going to make the budget situations for a lot of states a lot worse. And I think that the in many ways, the budget situation, the juvenile justice situation is really going to be number one and two on the agenda next year. Budget's going to get a hell of a lot more attention if Trump is elected president. So we'll have to kind of wait and see as we only have, you know, two weeks before Election Day and then we'll pivot to the General Assembly and see what the budget looks like and then perhaps juvenile crime as well. John Danny, thank you so much for joining us this evening. I appreciate your time. You're welcome. This week, I pressed Secretary Schiraldi on his job performance, and he says it's other people's job to grade him. How would you grade your job performance at this point? I think it's actually other people's job to grade me. I'm asking you right now, how would you grade yourself? And I'm answering you. I think it's other people's job to grade me, and I think that my job is to come to work every single day, trying to hold kids accountable, rehabilitate them, and improve public safety. The secretary didn't answer directly, so we asked you, how would you grade the secretary of DJS? We'll take a look at what you had to say after the break. Here's tonight's primetime lineup on Fox 45, brought to you locally by your McDonald's owner operators. This week, we asked how would you grade Secretary Vincent Schiraldi? Let's take a look at some of your responses. And overwhelmingly, almost every single person had the same response, F. They say that people say that he is a failure and that he needs to resign. Thank you for sharing your opinions. That's all for this week's edition of Fox 45 News In Depth. I'm Mackenzie Frost.